Let's now quantify the amount of heat gained or lost by a system. But before we do that, we need to keep in mind that there are two scenarios. Either we have a pure compound in a single phase, solid, liquid, or gas phase, and its temperature can increase if we supply heat or decrease if we remove heat, but there is no phase change. Or we have a pure compound that undergoes a phase change and therefore has a temperature that remains constant because a pure compound has a constant temperature during a phase change. And because we have these two scenarios, we actually have two different formulas because we need to be able to account for the fact that temperature can change and does change in the first case and temperature does not change in the second case. And so for that, we need to first define specific heat and then latent heat. So let's start with specific heat. Specific heat, C, of a compound is the amount of heat required to increase one kilogram of compound by one degree Celsius or one degree Kelvin because an increase in one degree Celsius is the same as an increase in one degree Kelvin. And so specific heat, well, is specific to the compound. So if you have an aluminum slab here, let's say, well, the specific heat of aluminum is approximately 900 joules per kilogram degree Celsius or degree Kelvin. And let's say for the sake of simplicity that this slab is one kilogram. Well, if you wanted to increase the temperature of this slab by one degree Celsius without melting it, you would have to supply 900 joules. So 900 joules to increase T, the temperature, by one degree Celsius. And so that's the idea of specific heat. It's specific to the compound. Each compound has its own specific heat, and it tells you how much energy you would have to supply to take one kilogram of that compound and increase its temperature by one degree Celsius, as long as there is no phase change. So if it starts to melt, then this doesn't work anymore. But because of what we just said, it makes sense that the heat required to increase or decrease the temperature of a mass M of compound is given by Q is M times C, the specific heat, times delta T, the change in temperature, right? It makes sense. Mass, if you have more than one kilogram, well, you have to multiply by, you know, seven kilograms if uh, that's what you have. So you need seven times more energy. And if your delta T is not one degree, but it's 10 degrees, well, then you have to multiply the whole thing by 10 also because you have to increase the temperature by one degree 10 times if you want to think of it that way. And so Q is equal to MC delta T is the formula that will give us the amount of heat required to change the temperature up or down of your pure compound by an amount delta T. And that's the nice thing about that formula is that Delta T takes care of making Q positive or negative. If delta T is positive, Q is positive. Makes sense. You have to supply heat to increase temperature. If delta T is negative, Q is negative. Makes sense. You have to remove heat out of your pure compound to drop its temperature by delta T. So let's have a look at a quick example. We have 100 grams of ice at negative 15 degrees Celsius, and we would like to figure out the energy required to bring it to minus 5 degrees Celsius, given that the specific heat of ice is 2,090 joules per kilogram Kelvin. Now note that no phase change, right? Ice at negative 15 is solid, and if it goes up to minus 5, still solid. It melts at zero. So there is no phase change to account for. We'll see how we do that in problems if we have to have multi-step reasoning. But in this case, we're good. So we can compute Q, the amount of heat required to increase the temperature of our block of ice by 10 degrees Celsius. And that would just be MC delta T. So it's M ice, which is 100 grams. Now careful, we need kilograms. So that's 0.1 times specific heat, 2090 times T final, which is minus 5, minus, careful, double minus, because initial temperature is negative 15, 
and that's going to be equal to, well, actually 2,090 joules because 0.1 times 10 is 1, so that's the amount of heat that we have to supply. So it's pretty straightforward. There's really nothing hard mathematically about this formula, um, but it is a matter of applying it to a pure compound that does not undergo a phase change because, as we're going to see, we have different formulas that we need to use for a phase change. I mean, look, let's just, you know, think this through. T initial is T final during a phase change because temperature doesn't change. So then you'd have Q equals zero. Well, that makes no sense. If you actually want to melt an ice cube into liquid water, you have to supply heat. It doesn't happen otherwise. So you couldn't argue that it's MC delta T because if delta T is zero, Q is zero. And if Q is zero, the ice cube doesn't melt at all. So we need different formulas, and that's what we're going to go to next. So for that, we need to define latent heat. Now, latent heat of a compound is the amount of heat required to take one kilogram of compound and take it from solid to liquid or from liquid to gas. Now, each different phase change has a different latent heat. So from liquid to solid, that's called the latent heat of fusion. From liquid to gas, it's called the latent heat of vaporization. It's the name of the transformation associated with latent heat. So if you take a compound from solid to liquid, you have to supply heat to melt it. And so Q for a melt is going to be, now we're going to need the latent heat of fusion, which we can look up or it's often given. And it's a positive amount of heat because it has to be supplied to the compound. And the latent heat is the amount of energy per kilogram of compound. And so we'd have to multiply this by the mass M of compound that we are trying to take from solid to liquid phase. So Q melt is going to be plus ML fusion, which is also a rather simple formula. Now, if you want to do the opposite, if you had the, the same compound, same amount as liquid, and you want to solidify it, so you want to freeze it, then you would have to remove an amount of heat, Q freeze. Now, it turns out the amount of heat that you have to remove is exactly the opposite amount that you had to provide to melt it. So it's minus, because it's a loss to the system, M times L fusion. And so, well, first of all, it's remarkable that it's the same amount in magnitude one way or the other. But second of all, it means you have to pick the right formula. And it's not like Q equals MC delta T. That was nice. Delta T positive, Q positive. Delta T negative, Q negative. Cool. The formula takes care of it for you. Here you have to make a conscious decision to either pick the formula with the plus or with the minus. But it matters, and so that's why you need to know what's going on. Are you going from solid to liquid? or from liquid to solid. Similarly, the same reasoning holds for liquid to gas or gas to liquid. So Q for liquid to gas, then it's going to be Q vaporization is equal to plus, because you need to supply heat, M times the latent heat of vaporization. And so Actually, let's call this Q-boil because that's what I called it in the notes. So if you boil off liquid water and create steam, so you go from liquid to gas phase, the amount of heat required to boil the water is mass times latent heat of vaporization. And of course, if you wanted to condense steam into liquid water, you would have to remove the same amount of heat in magnitude. Of course, you'd need a minus here because it would be a loss to your system. And so the same comment applies that, yes, it is a simple formula, but it's on you to pick plus or minus in the case of a phase change. So those are the four formulas that you can encounter because we don't go from solid to gas directly and so forth. That's, that's better dealt with in an actual thermal class versus uh, just a calorimetry class. Calorimetry, we tend to focus a lot on solids and liquids, a little bit of gas phase here and there, but carefully, because there's stuff we don't know yet that we're going to learn about 
in the chapter about the first law of thermodynamics. So let's apply this. Let's say that we have 200 grams of water, and it's condensing at 100 degrees Celsius. So in other words, it's steam, but it's condensing. How much energy is going to be released? In other words, how much energy would you have to pull out of water as it condenses? Well, it's a phase change, and it's energy, or heat rather, that has to be removed, so it's going to be minus, and really it's a condensation. So Q condensation is minus M LVAP. And so that's equal to minus, we need 200 grams and kilograms, so that's 0 0.2, 22.6 times 10 to the 5, which is approximately minus 45.2, 10 to the 4 joules. So not a complicated calculation either. As long as you can identify your phase change, pick the right formula, it's pretty much plug and chug. Certainly it gets complicated if you want to do multiple transformations in a sequence, or if you wanted to mix two substances together, such as ice cubes and hot liquid water, what's the final temperature? And those problems we will do as practice problems, and we'll see how to take it step by step and to think about things in a simple way so that we don't get too confused about what's going on. Um, but that's not the goal here. The goal is to emphasize the fact that there are two possible scenarios. Either no phase change and temperature can go up or down, Q is MC delta T, or phase change and then Q is plus or minus mass times latent heat, where you have to pick the proper latent heat given the phase change. Thanks for watching this video. We created Cogverse Academy to help you save time by focusing on what matters most when studying for exams. If you'd like to learn how Cogverse Academy can personally help you improve your grades, check us out at cogverseacademy.com and send us an email if you have any questions. We'd love to help you.